All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome, welcome online, welcome in the room. Um, so this is our embodied ethics class. Um, we are talking tonight about altruism. Um, so we're here at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, which I'm really loving with this series of classes that every topic that we've been covered, uh, every ethical topic that we've been covering, the Dharma Center is an embodiment of it. <laughs> so I'm really loving that that kind of connection that really makes sense. Um, so tonight with altruism, you know, that like the Dharma, the, the driving intention behind the Dharma Collective is to exist for the good of the community, for the well-being and benefit of others. Um, so just like I've been saying with our other classes, uh, we are sitting inside an embodiment of altruism just by being here in the physical space, online. So um, thank you to the volunteers, board members, everyone that uh, brings the Dharma Collective to life uh, for the well-being of, of others. Um, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Tig. Uh, I am a meditation teacher, a contemplative artist. I trained in medical and research institutions, and that's also where I teach. Um, so at the Mayo Clinic, um, Brown University and Pratt Institute, and here at the Dharma Collective. Um, and you know, with this theme of altruism, I was reflecting on like, what is it that brought me to teaching? And I was reflecting on that there was a very specific moment where I had been practicing for many years and, and I almost started seeing the practice and the teachings as medicine. And uh, I kind of something clicked in me of like, oh, it would actually be selfish if I just kept this to myself. And so the driving kind of motivation that I had in starting my teacher journey was um, altruism to you know spread these this medicine um, for the well-being of others. So um, I, I can't really see it, but the shirt at one time said heavily meditated, which I kind of love because it's like got that parallel with the me heavily medicated, but it's heavily meditated. Um, so this shirt is kind of like a ground for altruism for me. <laughs> So here we are kind of exploring what embodied ethics means. Um, so if you're just joining for the first time, we have a bunch of recordings on YouTube that kind of sets up in more detail um, kind of the journey that we've been on and um, the background of embodied ethics. But the Cliff Notes version, um, kind of ethics as a, uh, a system or actions and behaviors that contribute to the well-being of others. Um, We've been, have been using this word constructive a lot, constructive action, constructive um, thoughts, constructive intentions, where a lot of unethical um, concepts might be considered destructive. Personally, for me, that's really what makes a difference. It is really hard, you know, to kind of like nail down exactly what are ethics. It can be very subjective. And so for me, I kind of like it's a very simplistic version. If it's constructive for self, other environment, planet, community, then it's ethical. If it's destructive, it causes harm to self, to other, to community, to planet, then it's unethical. Um, that's my simplified version of it. Um, but this idea that it's embodied, you know, it's not just we're thinking about ethics, but we're also practicing them and that we're experimenting and trying things out on what it feels like in the body, what it feels like when we hear each other speaking, when it, what it feels like when we hear these teachings or points of view around ethics. Um, what is it like when we go out into the world after being in this class? How do we show up? How do we embody what it is that we're learning and exploring here. Um, so that we don't just leave it in the room or leave it in our neurons, that we actually go out into the world and practice. Um, so there has been a theme very clearly emerging. Uh, we're on week seven now of this series. And there has been a theme that we've really been exploring a lot around our form of economy and how ethics relates to kind of the world as we participate in this economy. Uh, and how do we protect our minds and our hearts as we move through an economic system that is pretty unethical? Uh, so 
Um, we're going to continue that tonight. Um, for those of you that saw kind of the promotion, the flyer for this, it's altruism, capitalism's disease. So we're going to be talking about how altruism, but also how it is considered to be a disease to the functioning of capitalism. Um, so I'll present uh, a couple different points of view on that, and we'll have some time to talk about it. And then um, we'll also have two periods of practice tonight. So one which is going to happen shortly is just a opening uh, reflection and arriving. Uh, and then we'll have our uh, teaching and discussion, and then we'll actually end tonight with a practice um, to cultivate that ethic of altruism. So with that, let's um, let's start settling in for just uh, maybe about a 10 minute practice. So finding a way that's comfortable to hold the body. And before we come into stillness, I want to invite a little bit of movement if it feels good, maybe just giving yourself a little massage in the hands, treating yourself to this little gift of touch and release. And this is an act of both giving and also receiving. And so maybe you want to extend that up one of the lengths of the arms if that feels good. Massaging up to the shoulder and then maybe patting down back the arm. And then switching, just giving your arm a little massage, a little love. And then coming back down, just getting the energy moving. And then let's try out a little acupressure. So coming to the third eye, just lightly tapping right here on the center of the forehead. It helps bring our awareness into focus and a concentrated state. You can stay here with this tapping, or maybe you want to try out some very gentle squeezing of the eyebrows, moving down the length of the eyebrow. And this whole area is known to stimulate the meridians of concentration. So perhaps setting an intention to be present to be focused, to be here for our session together. And then let's come down to the heart center, maybe tapping with one or both hands right in the middle of the chest, if that feels comfortable, kind of waking up the seat of emotions, the heart center here. And then maybe placing one or both hands on the chest and some very gentle circles here. Just coming into awareness of the heart. Maybe set, setting an intention to bring an open heart to this session tonight. Since we're talking about altruism, a very heart-centered concept. And then taking a deep breath in and on the exhale, relaxing into stillness. Perhaps you like to take a few more deep breaths just to arrive and settle in. Let go of what happened before. Not concerned about what comes after. Just being here in this moment. And noticing what's alive for you right now. Perhaps sensations in the body. Maybe it's an energy in the mind, lingering conversations or activities of the day. What mood are you in right now? And what emotions are here? And whatever it is that you're noticing, welcoming the fullest expression of the present moment right now. No need to fix or change. No expectation of how you should or shouldn't be feeling in this moment. Just giving yourself permission, the gift to allow yourself to be exactly as you are.
So we're going to make a transition to a short reflection for our opening practice. So gathering up all the attention, coming to the domain of the mind and the heart. And last week we explored gratitude and gifting economy. What is it like to receive? So let's begin there. We're calling to mind something that you receive some someone else, something like a gift or an act of kindness that you received. It can be a big thing, a small thing. Maybe it's a material object that someone gifted you, or perhaps it was the present of time, support, love. And as you call to mind this gift that you received, just notice how does it feel? What comes up in the body? And as we start to shift our attention from receiving to giving, the next reflection point is calling to mind something that you did for someone else maybe an act of kindness, maybe a gift, maybe checking in on a friend. Maybe imagining that you're doing this act of kindness or giving this gift. And again, what comes up in the body? How does that feel? No expectations here of what you should be feeling, just noticing, being curious, what arises with these reflection prompts. And now considering something that you may have done to benefit your community. And again, it can be big or small, it can be a material object, it can just be walking around your neighborhood and smiling. How does that feel? Have you noticed the mind wandering, getting lost in thoughts or analysis or distracted by sounds or sensations in the body? And we just use our mindfulness practice to notice that's what's happening and come back without any judgment. Shifting now to our next reflection point of considering something that you did to benefit the earth. Maybe walking or riding your bike, maybe recycling, turning the lights off when you left the house. And how does that feel? No matter how small or minute that action may have been, how does it feel to know that it's contributing to the well being of this planet? And our final reflection point, this one's a little bit more complicated, but calling to mind something that you did to take care of yourself that also benefited another. You may even want to consider coming to a class like this coming for the benefit of teachings and practice, but also to move out into the world and spread ethics and goodness, benefiting all those that you'll come into contact with after this class. So how does that feel to consider something that benefits yourself and other people around you? Notice if this is a similar or a different flavor from the other reflection points. And 
Before we transition out of this practice, let's take a moment just to feel the body being supported by the chair and the floor, a cushion. Taking a moment just to be with the sensations of contact, a way of centering and grounding ourselves as we enter into our time together. And knowing that this is a, a home base for you. If at any point during the class, emotions arise or things become overwhelming, you can always return to this feeling of the body resting in the chair. Knowing that the support is always there for you, you just need to turn and look. An invitation here to follow the next breath all the way in through the nostrils, down into the chest. And then as you exhale, a slow and extended exhale, letting go of that breath, letting go of that opening practice. And as you transition back to open eyes, if they were closed, bring with it any awareness or presence that was cultivated in that practice. Maybe welcoming some movement back into the hands or the feet, maybe some stretches. <clears throat> Welcome to those that are just joining online. Nice to have you with us. So thanks for joining me in that short practice. I'm just curious what that might have been like for you as you reflect on um, what it was like to um, offer gifts to people around us or a community, the planet, especially that last one. What was it like to think about something that benefits us and other people? So if you're on Zoom, feel free to raise your hand or you can simply unmute yourself and talk. If you're in the room, just ask that you would uh, use this microphone so our friends on Zoom can hear you. So what was that like? What did you notice in that practice? I can go. Um, this is Tia, and I um, I was really bouncing between like the kind of uh, uh, the joy of giving, the sympathetic joy of being with people that I care about, and giving and receiving that uh, is memories of like actual direct experience, and then really uh, touching into the the struggle of receiving um, and um, the, the, I don't know, there's a difficulty in uh, uh, like who's giving first that mm -hmm. sometimes comes up. Um, mm -hmm. And, and a, a, a way of like once it gets big like to the planet like really kind of like since nothing's enough I can't I'm not like the the joy of giving gets feels diluted in the extra space so that's what mm. You're mm. thanks for sharing that Tia and did I hear correctly that you felt like it wasn't enough only when we got like you know what have you done for the planet? It's like, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> but, if, like, but with people and community, I feel in better balance. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Saw a lot of people nodding their heads. That seems resonant. Any other thoughts? Anything else come up for you? <clears throat> How about with that, that last one, something that benefits yourself and other people? Was that tricky? Was that accessible for you? How did that feel? So this is Cecily. <clears throat> um, 
I've come off uh, of a week last week of a lot of giving um, in an emergency. And I found that when you were describing the things, I was like, uh uh, not today. I'm done. I'm all done. It's time to pour back into me. Mm. And it was lovely <laughs> to, to know that I can say that because my person is safe. Like, mm. I, we fixed it. Everything's done. Like, I'm, mm. I'm literally no longer in a crisis. Um, so I got to be. For the moment we were contemplating, delightfully selfish, and unless I told you out loud, you wouldn't know. And I thank you for happy to answer. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna talk. About, we're gonna talk about selfishness tonight. So thank you for kind of uh, for naming that. It's not always a bad thing. <laughs> uh, and. Yeah, you know, like we're we're shifting. Last week we talked a lot about receiving, uh, and this week we're going to be shifting more towards giving. And so, you know, if I'm hearing what Cecily was saying is it can be exhausting, right? It can tire us out, right? Yeah. So we have to take care of ourselves so we can maybe keep doing more. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Louisa. Were you going to share? Uh, I'm glad your friend is safe, Cecily. I'm sure they're super happy you were able to help uh, in a time of crisis. Um, yeah, I'm actually in a in a interesting situation. A good friend just went into surgery today, and he's having a real hard time receiving help. And all of the friends are kind of trying to get him to accept help. And he's been just, I think, really overwhelmed with everything. And so it's it's been an interesting place where we're available for him if he needs us. And he probably will need us at some point. He needs to be off his foot for six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's been like we want to give, but he has a hard time receiving but I wanted to bring in when I thought about something that I can do that benefits others too. I was just cooking earlier today and I was trying to find someone to come eat with me and no one was available. And it's so interesting how like for me, if I cook and I share a meal with someone, even if I just give my neighbor some of it and, you know, it's it's a whole other scenario i don't know it's so much more inspiring for me to cook to know mm. that i'll be i'll be sharing that either like eating with them or sharing uh without having to sit with them necessarily but but that, mm. that's what came up so sorry to share yeah that. i really love the word I, I love that you said inspiring like it inspires you yeah so like not just our own well-being but the inspiration to offer others yeah and i also wanted to just name like the part of altruism around giving oftentimes is exactly what you just named availability it doesn't mean that someone will actually take it but like how meaningful is it to know that people are available if we need them or when we are ready to receive, uh, that there are people out there giving. So even just the availability um, that we can offer other people is a form of altruism. Uh, so thank you for naming that. Yeah. Any other thoughts, anyone in the room? So thank you for all of the, um, the shares of those that were spoken, also those that weren't. Um, and I think, you know, this, what we did here really points to that there is a felt experience to this. It's not just a cognitive thing. And it really shows how, whether it's being exhausted from giving or being inspired by it, you know, whatever it may be, there's a felt experience. How does it feel to give, how to offer support to other people, to our communities, to the environment? Um, and so I really like these reflections when we're talking about altruism, because it's not so much about like 
keeping track, keeping score of like, did I do enough? It's not really about that. It's more of how does it feel? You know, how does it feel for us to give? Um, while there are things like needing rest and knowing our boundaries, which we're going to talk about today, um, it's really taking time to check in with ourselves. Like, how did that feel to hold the door for someone or to say thank you or to cook a meal for someone? Um, it really helps kind of with that motivation to keep doing more when we stay with the feeling of altruistic actions and behaviors. So the one, one of the components of tonight, obviously, is altruism. And so this kind of really simple definition of altruism being a, a thought, an aspiration, a wish, uh, an action, a behavior that would benefit others. Uh, this, there's a lot of definitions of altruism also include the word selflessness which we're going to talk about um, because sometimes there, there's like an extreme there of like giving more than we might have or giving in a way that depletes us and we need to take care of ourselves so i'm a little iffy on the selflessness part um, but we'll talk about that it's for now it's just about the, the well-being of others so I'm going to, I want to read this passage. Some of you may be familiar with Matthew Ricard, uh, who um, is a Tibetan monk. Um, and I just really like the way that he kind of frames uh, altruism. So he says, we have all to varying degrees had the experience of profound altruistic love. Even right there, he's associating altruism with love. Amazing of a feeling of all encompassing benevolence, of intense compassion for those who are suffering. Some people are naturally more altruistic than others, at times to the point of heroism. Others are more focused on themselves and find it hard to consider the welfare of others as an essential goal, and even harder to put the welfare of others before our own. In any case, it is essential to cultivate altruism. Being altruistic not only helps us to benefit others, but is also the most satisfying way to live. So there, we're kind of seeding. It's not just about benefiting others. It also feels really good. This is the opposite of a heightened feeling of self-centeredness, which cuts us off from altruistic love and compassion and only brings pain to ourselves and others. In general, when altruistic thoughts arise in our minds, they're fairly quickly replaced by other less wholesome thoughts, such as anger or jealousy. No judgments. That is why if we want altruism to play a major role in our being, we must spend time cultivating it because just wishing is not enough. We must realize that in the deepest part of ourselves, we do not want to suffer. We want to be happy. Once we've recognized this aspiration, the next thing we must do is realize that all beings share it. So this really touches in on a lot of the things that we've been exploring in this series of classes, particularly that last one. This is compassion, right? That all beings share that same desire to um, be happy and free. And one of the pillars of secular ethics is this interdependence and shared humanity. Uh, that we can all relate to that. We all come from different walks of life. We all have different experiences, different joys, different sorrows. But the common thread is that we all share um, this, this aspiration to not suffer and be happy. Uh, this all-encompassing benevolence, intense compassion for those who are suffering. I kind of love this idea of altruism. A lot of times we talk about loving kindness and compassion. It's two separate things, and, and they are. Kindness is the wish for happiness. Uh, compassion is the wish for freedom from suffering. And I love that altruism brings together both. It's kind of like a one-stop shop for the heart-opening practices. Um, even harder to put the welfare of others before our own. So again, this kind of selflessness, you know, I'm not promoting in, in this class that we do that. I don't think as, as, as Noam and I were talking about earlier today, like we can't fall on our own swords. We're not, we're go, no benefit to anyone else if we are depleting ourselves or we're not maintaining our boundaries. Um, so I think he is right. It is harder to put the welfare of others. Um, before before our own. Um, but it doesn't mean that we're not altruistic. If we take care of our wants and needs, we're going to talk about this next week, kind of the difference between a want and a need. 
So if we're giving to a point where it depletes our needs, that might become problematic. And then we can't give any more than that. Um, but if it's we can give and we sacrifice some of our wants, then maybe there's a little bit more room there for altruism uh, that doesn't deplete us. And then this point about the opposite of self-centeredness. Altruism is the opposite of self-centeredness. It's the awareness. It's the awareness of the well-being of other people, community, the planet, all of those things that are around us. And when we're self-centered, none of that really matters. It's almost like the spotlight is turned in but we've been given this beautiful gift that shines outwards. And so a lot of the theme tonight is gonna to be this kind of back and forth of how do we take care of ourselves and other people? Um, we must spend time cultivating it. That's why we're here, we're practicing, right? I do believe, and it will come up in, uh, in another reading, um, that it is innately in us, that we are innately altruistic. It's just that there's things that are layering on top of us. I come from a school of thought and a worldview that we are inherently good, that these nature, that these, um, these aspects that we're talking about, loving kindness, compassion, altruism, ethics are available to us. It's not something that we have to go out and get but we do have to cultivate it. We do have to uncover what might be blocking us from that, you know, the onion, peel back all of those layers of, of hurt and conditioning and, you know, foreshadowing capitalism <laughs> that makes it harder um, to cultivate it, but it's there uh, and that we all share it. So before we move on, I, I wanted to name um, also that this isn't really about, um, aspiring to be perfect or to feel bad if we don't feel like we're we're not giving you know we have to take care of ourselves like we heard cecily like it's exhausting and so to not feel bad if taking care of ourselves means that we're not as giving as we might want to be there's no judgment in this class around that it's really more of an opportunity for you to check in on where you're at i'm not telling you that you need to be a certain way or not um, also, as, as we were talking earlier today, a lot of these teachings are kind of given in the framework of the ultimate nature. Like if everything was perfect and we lived in this enlightened state of being um, that, yeah, we could we could walk around just giving and loving and compassionate. Um, but we live in a very real relative world. And so we might aspire to some of these values but also being really realistic. Like we do need to take care of ourselves. We do live in an economy where there is scarcity and lack mindset. So we do need to make sure that our basic needs are met before we can really give to others. Um, and I wanted to name that because in my journey, even though the this class is slanted more on the secular viewpoint, in my journey through studying and practicing Buddhism and other spiritual practices, there's been this kind of self-sacrifice or that like, oh, I'm just attached to my body and my belongings. Uh, and so I can't, I, I can't, um, I can't give. Um, so I, I want to be realistic here, you know, that we're not saying throw yourselves to the wolves for the benefit of the wolves. Right. Um, we do need to take care of ourselves. I just wanted to set that framework because sometimes these teachings can come across as very high level. You know, there, there's actually a teaching in Buddhism where it's like you feed yourself to the lioness so she can feed her cubs or her cubs. And that is a beautiful aspiration. But also, how are we going to continue benefiting other people if that happens? You know, so anyway. Um, as we've been talking uh, a little bit about, like, we do need to have boundaries. Um, so I want to kind of evolve this idea of, of uh, talking about altruism to how that might show up in our form of economy. Um, so those of you that uh, are familiar with this term, that altruism is considered to be a disease to capitalism. So we're going to go a little bit deeper into that. This book, I've mentioned it during the series of this class, it's called The Buddha on Wall Street. Uh, it's been super influential on me and, and my worldview on the economy and the spiritual practices. I highly recommend it. Um, it's a very down to earth, easy to understand, uh, like a lot of economics. It's super confusing and like even it feels like really over, over, over my head. 
Um, but this book really feels relevant and applicable to uh, understanding. So I want to read a couple points here. Um, so this is um, really a point of view around capitalism in general. Capitalism has led us to a situation in the world today in which it's possible to conceive of a fulfilling life for all, but further progress is being suffocated by a neoliberal form of capitalism that threatens the environment and perpetuates suffering in the world. Primitive instincts for individual survival, such as greed and hatred, served us well in earlier evolutionary times. But as Darwin argues, the human species has succeeded because of characteristics such as sharing and compassion. Especially now in our interconnected world where our actions ricochet rapidly from place to place and can threaten our very survival, the progressive evolutionary impulses of sharing and compassion need to flourish. Instead of neoliberal capitalism with its emphasis on greed and selfishness, we need a different form of economic organization, one that combines thoughtful self-interest and the creative energy and dynamis, dyna, dynamism of capitalism with the values of generosity and altruism. One that combines thoughtful self-interest and the creative energy of capitalism with the values of generosity and altruism. So, you know, I think, <clears throat> as we've been exploring in this class, this isn't necessarily about down with capitalism, let's get rid of it and replace it with gifting economies or an altruistic economy. It's more about how do we cultivate these values of generosity, which is what we talked about last week, and altruism, which is what we're talking about this week. So we're living in a system that thrives on being self-centered. Capitalism needs us to be focused only on ourselves in order for it to work. And so what I am kind of proposing is some consideration around how do we participate in the system because we have to, it's what here, it's what's here, it's the water that we swim in, but protect our heart. How do we still uncover these innate qualities of kindness, compassion, altruism, giving, generosity, even though we're surrounded, bombarded by marketing messages, by selling tactics that tell us that there's not enough or that we're not enough or that there's not enough for us to give. Um, many of you, are any of you familiar with Anne Rand, the familiar name? Yeah, so the, um, she's referred to a lot in this book. For those of you that are not familiar, she uh, lived is a Russian immigrant that lived in the US, she passed away in the 80s um, and um, had some very, strong philosophical views on this. So she saw altruism as a disease that was incompatible with freedom, with capitalism, and with individual rights. For her, altruism was a kind of primitive social instinct left over from our earlier evolution as humans. Interesting how that's kind of opposite of what we just heard. She held the view that we may still be in evolution as a species and we may be living side by side with some missing links. These missing links can be found, she thought, in those people who fail to utilize their rational selfishness. It's kind of hard to even read this to its full potential. <laughs> she deeply believes, uh, so there's some, some um, gendered pronouns in here that I'm gonna do her the favor of switching because this is a quote. She deeply believed that each human must live as an end to themselves and follow their own rational self-interest. Uh, in one of the books that she wrote, that's called Atlas Shrug, the hero exclaims, I swear by my life and my love of it that I will never live for the sake of another man, nor ask another man for, to live for mine. Her conclusion that was, if any civilization is to survive, it is the morality of altruism that men have to reject. And this is the person that has influenced the economy that we participate in, right? All the way up into Paul Ryan, who quotes her in a lot of his speeches on the house in, in the past. So I can tell from the reactions, at least in the room, that there's an aversion to some of these things that we're hearing. It's hard for me to say a lot of it, but yet we live in it. This is the starting point of our economy, you know, of, of our political views on our economy. And and it's not just Republican. 
So the uh, the idea that there's another section I want to read from before we move into a discussion that altruism that these these heart qualities are actually a limited resource that we don't have enough and we need to be really careful where we spend these heart qualities. I also don't agree. And before we move into that, I, I do, I love this kind of counter argument from our man, the Buddha. The Buddha told his disciples, go forth and go forth for the good of the many, for the happiness of the many, out of compassion for the world, for the welfare, for the good and the happiness of others. Even just reading that, it feels very different. You know, it's a completely different energy of this kind of altruistic orientation to life versus one that that proposes that our thriving as a species comes from our selfishness. So one more point of view, and then we can open it up for some discussions on this. Um, going back to that idea that um, that altruism or that these qualities of the heart are limited resources, which both political parties considered to be true. <clears throat> uh, so in reference to Anne Rand, their way of thinking about altruism, generosity, and love as resources of limited supply, like a fossil fuel that is diminished with every use, is bizarre. <clears throat> altruism, generosity, solidarity, and civic spirit are not commodities that are depleted with use. They're more like muscles that develop and grow stronger with exercise. One of the defects of a market-driven society is that it lets these virtues languish. To renew our public life, we need to exercise them more strenuously. So what happens when we start exercising these more strenuously, when we start acting and behaving out there in the world and in a form of economy that is going in polar opposition from some of these, these um, values and ethics that we're exploring here. I have a couple of things to consider um, around how altruism is counterproductive to the, um, the system of capitalism, this um, what I call distortion of incentive. So that uh, if we were to operate in an altruistic way for the good of all, not just for self, that it would weaken the drive for individual achievement and excellence. So right now, we're really motivated for success by our own needs, our own basic needs, but also our own income. Uh, it is very self-centered. So if we start acting in a way that is truly altruistic, really considering if these actions, what I'm buying, how is this impacting other people? Where is this being made? Is me shopping in this place, spending my money with this organization or on this product, um, is it coming from ethical sources? Is it ethically made? Is it causing damage to the environment? Um, and so this idea of a distorted incentive uh, can come to play. Like it could actually be very damaging to capitalism. Uh, misallocation of resources. So um, altruistic impulses result in the misallocation of resources within a capitalist economy. So when resources are directed towards supporting those in need or pursuing social goals rather than being allocated to market demands and individual preferences, it will lead to inefficiencies. Our economy will collapse. If we like that, that's really powerful to consider. If we shift it from thinking about market demands and individual preferences to social goals and supporting those in need, capitalism will begin to fail. And then finally, this last point, infringement on freedom. Um, so there's a viewpoint that when altruistic values are imposed on individuals, largely through government intervention or social pressure, it infringes on their individual freedom. So we live in a country, for those of you that are in America, where liberty, we're, we're founded on liberty with no safety net, right? So it's, it's our own personal liberties at the expense of whatever. Whatever damage it causes, there's no safety net that's built in. So if we really consider altruism as a, a way of being in the world, as an ethical value that we embody, we might actually have to give up what we would consider to be some of our liberties or freedoms for the benefit of others. 
So there's a lot of really charged things in here. I'm presenting multiple people's points of view to kind of stir the pot. My point of view, as I already said, is we need to protect our heart, right? We still need to cultivate altruism, even though that we're operating in a world that is set up uh, anti that. It's the exact opposite. So I'm not here to try and suggest that we we bring down capitalism. I'm here to point to how important it is for us to practice cultivating an altruistic heart, which we, our practice is going to be tonight. But I want to open it up. What's coming up as you hear this? What is this? How does this land for you? What is what's resonating? What's making you angry? What's confusing? Let's open it up. Community dialogue, respecting other points of view, no advice, just deep listening as people speak from their heart. So again, if you're online, feel free to unmute or raise your hand and in the room if you could use the microphone. So altruism is the disease to capitalism. You can take some time to let that all absorb. Well, I'm no philosopher, but I would think that the highest form of rational selfishness is altruism, because when we're altruistic, we create a web of interdependence and kindness and reciprocity. It, it literally serves us in a selfish way, even though that may not be our intent. There's a there's a there's a selfishness even at the highest level of the bodhisattva. So I don't know what Anne Rand's talking about. That's that's crazy talk. I mean. There's only so many basic needs you can have met before you're a hoarder. So mm -hmm. we're here on this planet because that's our highest good. Those are the people we remember. We remember the Buddha and the Jesus Christ. And we don't remember Anne Rams. Mm -hmm. So can I ask a question? Yeah. We don't remember yet our economy is influenced by her. True. And by people that think this way. Yeah. I mean, these people have been all have always been around. Mm. I mean, the, the pharaohs, the kings of England. I mean, I, it's it's almost this, this sort of spectrum of enlightenment mm. rather than a, the individual system itself. Mm. I, I don't. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So the individual may fade away, but the values that are being instilled in the way that it's having a direct impact on our life, you know, and that we're continuing to propagate this when we go to the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. But it's such a challenge, right? Like how you can't, you, what are you going to, I mean, except for going and living in a cave somewhere, um, I don't, I, 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 it's, you know, no matter, I feel like no matter what I do, I'm contributing to it somehow. I mean, I feel like I have to think about it from like, what's the least amount of damage I can do because I'm going to be doing damage no matter what. And I really don't like that. I'd rather not be part of this system at all, but, um, it's so toxic. Mm -hmm. Can I ask how does it feel for you to share that, to say that? Um, I just feel my body very tense and, you know, um, have been a bit of a feeling of hopelessness a little bit, you know, it just feels overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being real with that. It is a lot of these ethics uh, conversations that we're having around ethics can feel really overwhelming. And I think it also goes back to what Tia was sharing is like the bigger it gets, the harder it might be, you know, or like it feels like it's not enough. 
like we feel like these little things that we might be doing here and there to affect change might not be enough. But trust me, those ripple effects, even coming to a class like this, you know, like having conversations, naming the discomfort in the body. I'm angry. I don't want, I don't like that. I have, to, I feel like I'm being forced into this and I don't like that. You know, it's, it's a sense of injustice comes up for me. So I think that this is the starting point. And one of the themes in this series of classes has been, we have to name it, right? So thank you for being brave and, and saying, you know, sharing with us how it feels. And I think that um, a lot of us really relate to what you're saying. It just feels really big and overwhelming. Thanks. I just wanted to say, and definitely anger, <laughs> yeah. which yeah. I, you know, I'd rather, I'd like to try to somehow transform that energy of anger into something useful as opposed to just grinding my teeth, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, for those of you that are familiar with the Cultivating Emotional Balance program, um, that we we really consider an emotion like anger to have a very potential constructive outcome, right? That it could actually be that motivation for taking action. Um, so one of the things that I think requires a lot of bravery, uh, in addition to naming the feeling, is also staying with it, right? Staying with the discomfort, because it's I, I've noticed in my experience, it's very easy for me to turn away, or it's very easy for me to just not think about it when I'm at the store, uh, but then nothing changes. You know, if we kind of just look the other way or we push those feelings down or we move our attention somewhere else. Now, I'm not saying that we self-sacrifice. I'm not saying that we just wallow in it, but as long as one of the teachers I, I was on retreat with last year, I love this idea. She said, take three small sips and then move on to something that brings you joy. So it's like take three small bites of that anger or dissatisfaction with capitalism or whatever it may be, and then go do something that feels good, you know, like ease into it rather than becoming so overwhelmed by it. I am. Um... I uh, keep wanting to hold the kind of both end multiplicity of the some of the things that you've said um, uh, throughout this, which is we're in capitalism and the capitalism has a lot to do with the, the self-serving and the hoarding. And it's not necessarily the use of money right? That those things aren't the same. And it came up again for me, uh, like the discernment of that we talk about capitalism and we, whoever we are, but when I talk about capitalism or when I'm hearing it, often I am, I either, I am conflating or I'm hearing a conflation of like capitalism of the, as the waters we swim in as society. So when we say, when somebody says, the, in, in those quotes, the end of capitalism, I can hear it as they're saying the end of society, which is maybe not the bad thing. Maybe it's just the end of capitalism on its way to a different use of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to hold all of that and it feels weird and awkward and big. Yeah. And not to add to that feeling, <laughs> but where does altruism fit in there for you? For me, it's, uh, I don't know, it builds the bridge, right? Like if we're going to get mm. from the place where winning capitalism is having enough money to build a spaceship instead of feeding people, like the decision of what to do with the hordes of dollars, if dollars are going to stay of, of value to redistribute that in a way that benefits people and the decision process the shift in decision process is benefits right it benefits pe people instead of person or benefits the idea of the ways that companies have become self-perpetuating um and yeah that's so i feel like it's the 
the like it's the road. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love it. I love that you said that. Build a bridge. Altruism, gratitude, gifting, kindness, all these ethics that we're exploring. They're the bridge. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Tia. And and again, also thanks for being real with that. It's big. How's it feeling to kind of be exploring this or this this concept that that altruism is a disease to capitalism? What does that feel like for y'all? See a lot of wheels turning. <laughs> if I can jump in, it's an extremely loaded way of talking about altruism. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is. I mean, wow, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, sorry, Tanya, were you? Finished? That's all I wanted to say. Is it's just that it's just it, it is. It is. It's totally yeah. Kind of it stirs the pot, right? <laughs> and it's true. Yeah. Angela. Yeah. For, for me, when it's framed that way, it makes me feel I want no part of capitalism in that case, if that's mm. the understanding of capitalism. Um, and, and I've heard uh, our current system of capitalism described many ways, like they call it late stage capitalism. In fact, right. recently I read an article uh, where the Pope uh, said, you know, children, families in Italy cannot afford to have children uh, because the cost of living is so high and, and he called it, it's due to savage capitalism. I've never mm. heard that word before he called it savage capitalism and, and, and you have crony capitalism. I mean, on the whole, um, I, 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 my, my, my thinking is that, you know, democracy is in place to hold capitalism in check. Mm -hmm. uh, unrestrained uh, capitalism, right? You need it, but you need it. Uh, it's, 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 maybe like the monkey, but you need it constrained to be effective. And, and somehow um, democracy is not very effective at this point in holding it under control of, yeah. So it, it's, 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 it's gone wild. Capitalism gone wild. That's what we are mm -hmm. dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. And, and same, same kind of question, like, thank you for sharing that with that point of view. Uh, and how does altruism fit in there for you? Um, so I, I think of capitalism just as a way uh, of a market economy, as a way to exchange goods. Altruism is bigger, much, much bigger. For society to function, you need altruism. Uh, market and a market economy doesn't replace society. And so if all you have is a market economy, then you don't have society and you don't, and you don't have altruism and it's, it's, um, not a good place to be, I think. If you put all your eggs in the basket of capitalism and, and a market economy and no no resources into uh, maintaining community and, and a society and or social mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know, I, I keep wondering, they keep talking about economy, economy, economy all the time. And I'm thinking, what about society? <laughs> Where are social goods? Like, why are we not foc focusing on social infrastructure and not just economic economic right. goals? And because economy you can count, but so good of society is a little difficult, more difficult to measure. Well, -being. right, right, absolutely, yeah. And it's like, how do we have an economy with social safety nets underneath it? Because I think that for me, my my viewpoint right now is that we capitalism gone wild. We have no safety nets. And in fact, America in particular was designed that way, right? There, it's just liberty. There is no do no harm, you know, like do whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt someone else. We don't have that. It's just do whatever you want, right? So, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate the, 
image that you're painting of like society versus economy. And I think that that's why this, these values, these ethics are coming through in our society, but not so much in our economy. And so how do we bring those together? Uh, Cecily. Hello. I wondered if you could expand on your feeling that we don't have social safety nets in the US because we do, but maybe because they're economic, you're thinking of social as something different. Um, sorry, maybe because they're actually monetary, that doesn't feel the same as social. Mm -hmm. Well, because yeah, and because they're linked directly with the economy. So uh, equitable health access to healthcare being number one for me, you know, that we, we have to pay for that. So I think a social, I'm not promoting socialism. I just want to say that. <laughs> no, I am. But, That's why my president gave me the ACA. Okay, great. I think that the, um, I think that our social safety nets of like we're talking about well-being for all in this country right now, the, sa the safety nets are well-being for some. And so I think like, how do we expand it so that, people have access to healthcare and education and the resources that they need to not just survive, but also thrive. Um, so I do agree that there, there clearly are social, some social safety nets in this country, uh, but in relation to like what we were just talking about with Angela, how so social society plugs into economy, it's really only benefiting a very small number of people. Um, so what's your viewpoint on that? I was really politely typing in the chat so I wouldn't uh, interrupt you again. Um, yes, here's the difference that you and I have. Uh, it's um, not bad, even a little bit. My social safety nets that I know my government offers are to keep you alive. Mm. Your vision of social safety nets are to help you thrive. And I agree, we do not have the thriving. And I also agree that the monetary options we have um, while they will keep you alive, they will not provide you with, what's the thing inside you that makes you know that you're a good person? Okay, sorry, that's a real question. You're conscious? I Say it again. You conscious? You conscious? Yeah. Sorry, I have aphasia, so sometimes I literally can't remember the word. Yeah, they don't make you feel like a good person. They don't let you know that you are supported. They're just like finger wagging. Yeah, so mm -hmm. mine keep you alive and, and yours will help you thrive. And now I can see the difference. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, and an interesting, it's a really interesting conversation because then where does the term well-being fit in? If we have, if we have survival on one side and thriving on the other side, where's well-being? You know, I think it's probably subjective, but, uh, you know, for me, I know we, ha we do have enough resources on this planet for everyone to be doing more than just survive. Right. And so I think for, for me, and it can be different for all of us that the well-being is more on this end, uh, is on the thriving end. But I really, I really appreciate uh, your point of view. I want to, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm all coming up to the surface now. <laughs> um. One concern I have, and I think I've brought this up before, uh, but I'll bring it up again, but I won't talk about it, is the number of human beings on this planet. I think that's a huge problem that is not uh, caused simply by or exacerbated simply by capitalism, but it, 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 it exacerbates a lot of the problems we have. And while I agree that there are enough resources on the planet now for everyone to thrive-ish. I think that that there, that's not unlimited. And unless we decrease the number of human beings on this planet, we're going to continue to destroy other living things and to some extent harm ourselves. But what I really wanted to talk about was that I have a really hard time 
with limiting there's when you read um ann rand and i i don't know her never met her but it seems to me that all of us experience altruism to a point i don't know if she has kids or siblings or parents that she loved and cared for and wanted good for but i'm guessing she did and i'm guessing all these people who espouse that altruism is the disease for capitalism do as well. I think it's a matter of like, where do you extend that sphere to? And I think that's something that in this practice we do, we talk about it all the time. It's, you know, all sentient beings, all sentient beings, all sentient beings. Do we really not believe that other people's good benefits us? Everybody there, you know, there are some sociopaths. It's maybe, half a percent of the population, but pretty much everyone else understands that the benefit to others is benefit to ourselves. But what do we mean by others and how can we extend that sphere beyond, you know, my partner or my child or my best friend? Right. Right. To include everyone. Mm -hmm. And it's challenging. And it's part of why the modern society and and the and going back to the population issue is that we're we're sort of uh, evolved to live in small bands of human beings where y- you do know everyone, mm-hmm. and so it's a no brainer to extend your altruism, which I do believe is inherent, you know, to everyone. But when it starts getting to like the way we live in the modern world in San Francisco is every day I see dozens or hundreds of people who I don't even know. And so then it becomes this whole other practice to to extend my compassion and love and altruism to them, mm-hmm. not to mention to the whole world, whatever that even means. That, you know, going back to what Tia said, like it it gets too big. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But but on a day-to-day basis, my practice is to do it with everyone I encounter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's all I can do. Yeah. That's embodying, right? That's embodying this ethic that we're talking about. Yeah. Thanks, Noah. Yeah, thank you. Can, can I say one more thing, too? Sorry, I'm kind of chatty. Yeah. And, um, um, you know, I don't know that one has to com- make like out al- like it's either altruism or capitalism, and you can't have both. It seems to me that that there could be like a middle ground, right? There's ways of of being a, um, having a business that are, have integrity and are, I, I would imagine allow people to have enough, right? Without having to have as much as they can, right? And then, and then their way of being in the community it's like you said, you have to, re- well, it's, and they're in the way that they use their resources to help others, right? So it's a balance, right? You know, I think there's, there's a middle ground, you don't have to like burn the whole house down. Um, I'm not an economist, that just is just kind of how I feel. But the way that our economy is going right now, and the way that things are built in, like, you know, having the stock exchange, and all it's about is like profits, it drives everything just for profit, 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 profit with, without that kind of, um, you know, I'm talking about the giant corporations, like on a smaller scale, smaller businesses, I think are probably more likely to be able to be function with integrity. But I just want to kind of put it out there because I didn't, it was feeling to me like it was like burning down the house, like either have one or the other, but it seems to me that there's some way of coexisting. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad that that you said that. And I agree. I I don't think that this is about like getting rid of capitalism and then replacing it with, um, I don't know what the term for an altruistic economy is, but like a gifting economy or something like that. The, The intention of this class is to stimulate conversation like this. And I love what you were saying about how do we find, I don't think you use these words, but how do we find the middle path? You know, how do we find balance? And I think that there was in in one of these readings about there is a certain level of creativity and innovation that capitalism does stimulate. Um, So how do we take the best of that model uh, of the kind of the free market 
and incorporate it with collective well-being. And one of the themes that I've heard from, th from three people already is size, right? It seems like this is more scalable within our friends, our families, our communities, our direct businesses. And so maybe that's just where we start. So, yeah. I want to leave a little bit of time for practice, but I know we have two more. So let's go to Daniel. Uh, a couple of thoughts about just from a personal perspective. For me, I feel like I need to be careful with how I think and engage in conversations like this. First of all, because in the past, feeling that feeling overburdened with my responsibilities has led me to harm and has also led me to try and be helpful in ways that were harmful. And I'll give an example of each. So for example, I used to be an active drug user, very dangerous drugs. And I remember the first time I got high, the first thought I had was, oh my God, I don't have to worry about the environment. That was the thought I had. It was this feeling that this weight that I had been carrying my whole life was like I had, was liberated from it. So that's like a very clear example of self-harm. In terms of for others, you know, I'm thinking about certain jobs that I had, for example, where I was, for example, going in as a white person into like a community of color where I, you know, thought that I like with a do-gooder kind of um, intention without really a appropriate sense of humility about what I could could or could not bring to the table based on just my own life experiences and the way I look. And that, that there was a part of that tied into my own ego about my right-sidedness, right-sizedness. And so those are just a couple of things that ways. So I have to be really careful about how I engage with these topics and it's also very important for me to feel empowered. Like no matter what the conversation is, you know, I want to be able to not leave feeling crushed or, or for me also to just to, to go into, there's also, I mean, talk about self-centeredness. There is such as there is a sense of narcissism and self-centeredness about just sitting there feeling like I'm responsible for everything. And so I love this idea of just the people I interact with every day. You know, I can be a shit on the road on my motorbike so occasionally. Or, yeah, occasionally. <laughs> you know, it's like that is something I have a lot more control over than capitalism and fixing it. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Boundaries, right? We talked about, I think it's super important that we make sure that we participate in this ethical orientation to life with very strong boundaries so that we're not causing harm to ourselves or others in an attempt to do good. And then going back to this quote from Matthew Ricard about um, some people are naturally more altruistic than others at times to the point of heroism being a hero, trying to save everyone, trying to fix everything, you know? So I agree, you know, we have to, we have to really monitor what our response is. Um, and then again, as you were saying, keeping it small, feels like there's this theme of like affecting action within a smaller, a smaller circle. I do want to point out because we are talking about economy and capitalism, our dollar, our money and where we spend it is one of the most powerful ways that we have to affect change. And so if you want to talk about empowerment, it's in your pocket, it's in your wallet. So we vote with our money, where we spend our money, the organizations, the product that we spend it on. That's super powerful. Yeah. Do you have your hand up? Yeah, um, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm attempting for concise. Um, I wanted to say at some point, 
um, that the altruism valve of the capitalism that we're experiencing in America, maybe since the beginning, but certainly since like 18 something is philanthropy. Um, the capitalists hoard the money and then funnel it through philanthropy back into whatever they're funneling it into. And uh, 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 modern day is, you know, the Gates Foundation can't give the money away fast enough. Jeff Bezos's ex can't give the money away fast enough. Um, so there's a there's some striving in there, but I think as a as a I don't think that we're I don't think that we're seeing it function altruistically the way we're talking about now. Um, oh, and oh, um, uh, there's a there's also in the way that capitalism functions a difference between the small companies and the large companies. The small companies I think really are kind of using money as a means of exchange. And corporations under corporate rules are kind of instructed. It's in the structure that they hoard money and hoard resources. Um, recently, which might be 10 years, there's a new kind of corporation that's a B Corp, where you get to say, my goal is not to hoard money. My goal, my goal is to use my profits for, for the good of something. Uh, I think Paul Newman's company is probably the the most well known, but but B Corps are becoming more and more. But it's changing the rules. Like that thing actually changes the rules of corporations, which are the big vehicle of capitalism that we're living in. Um, yeah, that one of those things. Beautiful. And what what is the turning point? What's what makes the B Corp different than something else? They don't have to, like, they need to be sustainable. They can't operate at a loss in some ways that, and they're not uh, asking for donations the way nonprofits are, but they are not required to maximize value for shareholders. They can have different goals. Which are based in? Based on the, the, the mission of the company. Um, I, the, the one that one that I'm working for right now is to serve you know, to serve the business interests of small businesses and and um, and outlier with outlier business owners, right? Like that's their goal. So they get to make choices that may not maximize profits that serve that goal. Right, and that goal being to benefit others. Yes. Right. So this is great. You know, like this is a big part of this 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 time together is to talk about. Um, solutions and ways of offsetting and different models and so you know maybe going back to the the previous comment that i just made is like maybe that we're really making sure that we're you know what is the model of the organization that we're supporting with our money that we're buying product from is it a b corp you know can we buy our clothes or our groceries from from organizations like this so um, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate all of the the shares, the 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 brave ones that talked about how difficult and uncomfortable it is, the ones that talked about um, solutions and different ways of circumnavigating the problematic aspects of this form of economy in relationship to these ethics, and especially that that point that we heard from Tanya about the middle path, about finding the balance. And my my point of view is that, as I said a couple times already tonight, is that we have to protect our mind and our hearts from this all pervasive, corrosive way, the society, this economy that we live in. And there are ways of doing it, offsetting, doing good, practicing, coming to classes like this, taking this home and having conversations with people in your community or journaling about it tomorrow morning. Um, just let it really sink in. Uh, and um, each of the meditations that we've been doing have really been about cultivating these ethical values, even among the exact opposite that we move about in the world. Uh, so one of the best ways that we can bring positive, constructive, ethical change is to practice. So let's do that for our last seven or eight minutes together. <clears throat> One of the things that we talked about tonight was how um, altruism covers this. It's like this umbrella for a lot of the immeasurable qualities of the heart, kindness, compassion, empathetic joy. We heard equanimity. 
So we're going to end our session tonight with just a little bit of a metta practice, a loving kindness practice. So altruism being for the benefit of all and loving kindness as a wish for happiness. So these two handshake in this practice. So maybe you'd like to close the eyes or soften the gaze. And just as we did at the start of the class, just notice what's here. Energy in the body, in the mind, in the heart. These conversations may have stirred things up. And so just noticing what it is that's here right now. And so to begin this practice of loving kindness, let's call to mind someone in our life that brings us joy. Smile to our face when we think of them. Perhaps imagining their image in front of you or just calling to mind their essence or likeness. And call to mind that this loved one or close friend experiences joy and gratitude. Notice what arises as you reflect on the joy of this person. And also that they experience stress, fear, anxiety, doubt. And notice what arises as you consider the suffering of this loved one. And so in a way that feels comfortable for you, we can bring those feelings of kindness, altruism, compassion into our heart and extend it to our loved one. So maybe that's just extending this feeling of kindness or compassion. Maybe it's visualizing a light or an energy emanating from the heart center, falling upon this loved one. Maybe it's offering them some wishes silently in your mind for happiness, peace, well being. Perhaps there's an intention that you'd like to set to offer after this meditation, this person, a gift, whether that's time, an object, or even just these silent wishes from your heart center right now. then you're welcome to invite your loved one to stay with you for the next few minutes of this practice as we expand our awareness to all those that are gathered here in this class, both on Zoom and here at the center. And calling to mind that just like you, all of these folks experience joy, happiness, pleasure, an altruistic wish for them to continue experiencing happiness and its causes. And also calling to mind that all of those in this room experience stress, anger, fear, and the heartfelt wish of compassion for them to be at ease as they navigate difficulty. Perhaps you'd like to visualize this altruistic light emanating from your heart, a wish for well-being of all of those gathered for our class tonight. Perhaps repeating those phrases silently in your mind, wishes for 
happiness, health, peace, ease. Then let's expand our awareness one more layer, stretching that heart's eye to include all beings. Those that we know, those that we don't know, those that are near, those that are far, those that are in human form, and also all the creatures of the land, sea, and sky. And calling to mind that just like us, all living beings want to be happy and free from suffering. And so if you're working with visualization of energy or light, perhaps seeing that extending in all directions from the body out into the world, touching every living being, Perhaps there's an altruistic wish that you would like to offer silently in your mind to all beings. A wish for happiness, for well being, for peace. And even though this seems like a very tall order to aspire for all beings to be happy and free from suffering, this is the starting point, this aspiration, this altruistic orientation to life. To move about the world in a way that benefits others while taking care of ourselves. to discern and choose wisely our actions, where we spend our money, the media that we consume, may it all be for the greatest benefit of all beings. When we end our session tonight, perhaps there's an intention that you'd like to set silently in your heart a way of moving forward, embodying this ethic of altruism in your own way, whether big or small. And there never really is an end to a practice like this. So even though in a moment we're going to transition back to open eyes and an awareness of the world around us, perhaps considering to let this practice continue moving with you as you go out into the world, allowing this beautiful altruistic heart of yours to lead And together, let's follow the next breath deeply in through the body, into the chest. And as we exhale, letting go of our session tonight, taking your time to transition back to open eyes if they were closed. I wanna offer deep bows of appreciation and gratitude to each of you for coming and exploring these embodied ethics. So we have two more sessions in this series. So I hope to see you next week, same time. Um, Dharma Collective is a Donna run organization. So your support through a donation allows us continue to um, be in the space and online and support our teachers. So um, maybe that's your first act of embodied altruism is making a donation if you can. And if not, Uh, A wish from your heart for the success of this center to continue propagating teachings like this is more than enough. So thank you all.